So thank you all for coming. Um, we've had quite a wild ride with North Korea this year, uh, going from fire and fury to a summit where <laughs> President Trump emerged saying that Kim Jong-un is a great guy and someone he can make a deal with. Um, we're going to talk about the history that led up to this, about uh, where we might go from here, um, what Kim wants and what he's willing to give up to get it, um, what the United States needs, what the implications for the greater region will be in Northeast Asia, our relationship with China, our longstanding alliances with South Korea and with Japan. And here to help us think through these important issues um, is a panel with deep experience in um, covering Northeast Asia and specifically Korean issues and being involved in, uh, in the case of if Chris Hill, in negotiations. So Chris was um, ambassador to South Korea and then became chief negotiator with North Korea um, during the six party talks from 2005 until toward the end of 2008. Um, and the last big agreement that was made with North Korea was in 2005. There was, of course, also a 1994 agreed framework that actually held for a few years before um, North Korea decided that it wanted to continue with its nuclear program. Um, we also have Jung Pak, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and Korea chair. And she also has long experience uh, with the CIA and with intelligence analysis of the Koreas and of Northeast Asia geopolitical and security issues. And um, finally, Jay Lefkowitz was President George W. Bush's point person on human rights in North Korea and um, has a perspective on the extent to which uh, human rights could and should be included in negotiations as we go forward and try to figure out a sustainable way to have security in Northeast Asia. Um, Chris, let me start with you. Um, since you spent four years of your life um, negotiating with North Koreans on these issues. I've been in therapy ever <laughs> since. <laughs> and I know when you were negotiating, you um, were given instructions. Among them, do not toast with the North Koreans. Um, do not e even you know, participate in a toast. Do not smile. Um, President Trump may have overcorrected with this summit. Yeah, I, I, you think? <laughs> yeah. But how are you reading what happened and, and what possibilities it leaves open and where things could go from here that would be in U.S. interest? You're talking about the whole sort of Singapore fling then? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I think the president was right uh, to, to meet with the North Koreans. I mean, ideally, you start at a lower level, kind of move up. Uh, when there are problems, the next level would try to address those problems. So this time we start at the very top, and yes, that adds a certain degree of difficulty. But I think it was the right, it was the right thing to do. The military options were not particularly uh, compelling. There was a lot of talk in Washington about something called the bloody nose, where we would hit them with a missile and say, there's more of where that came from. But the problem was, what if North Korea retaliated? What would happen to the 20 million South Koreans who were within range of 14,000 uh, North Korean artillery tubes? So not a lot of easy options. So the idea of having a, a negotiating track, I think, made some sense. Uh, the concern I have is that we, we had a joint statement that, frankly, didn't go very far. And um, you know, it's always the, it's the fate of every peace envoy to say, my deal was better than the next deal. Certainly, I heard a lot of, from the Clinton people that their deal was better than my deal. And then I kind of feel my deal was better than Singapore. But um, whatever. I think it's now time for some serious diplomacy. The Secretary of State uh, wants to do this directly, and the President wants him to do it directly. So I think he's going to go to North Korea, and they're going to begin a, an effort to try to convince North Korea to give up their weapons. Now, handshakes are better than uh, you know, uh, shaking of your fist. And so I can see why they tried to create this very warm atmosphere. But I think the consequence may have been that it went too far. And the North Koreans, who never miss an opportunity to miss the right signal, may have thought, aha, this is an expression of weakness. We're in a more powerful position. Certainly, it has sort of undermined China and South Korea's interest in so-called maximum pressure, really putting on the, uh, putting the screws to the North Koreans. 
it's also, I think, created a circumstance where there's nowhere to go if the Secretary of State can't get stuff done, if the President can't get stuff done. I don't see where the negotiating track goes. So I think uh, the, the Secretary of State has to come back with something. I would suggest he start with a, uh, we have this declaration, I would suggest we all kind of forget about that and go to the issue of can we have a declaration of what their nuclear programs are? Could that declaration for the first time include highly enriched uranium, the second way to get to a bomb? You know, the North Koreans, that's what, tore, that, that's what ended the Clinton era. Uh, effort because the North Koreans were importing materials consistent with a highly enriched uranium uh, effort and they never mentioned it in any of their declarations. We had the same problem. So I think if, um, if the Vice President could come back with a list of what their nuclear programs are, including highly enriched uranium, that might buy him some important time and time in, in, in Washington. And then, uh, you know, we'll take it from there. But I think uh, it's a very tall order. Okay. Um, Zhang, let me go to you. Uh, you've written about Kim Jong-un, his influences from childhood, you know, how he was being groomed from being a little kid to become the next great leader, you know, his time in Switzerland, going to school there. He wasn't a great student, but he loved sports. Um, he, uh, his ruthlessness in you know, protecting his power and making sure that those who challenge him don't stick around very long to continue to challenge him. As you look at everything that's led up to this summit and what happened during it. Um, what do you think he wants? And what do you think he'd be willing to give up to get it? Uh, I think Kim got what he wanted um, in that for the, past, for the first six years of his rule, um, when, he took, when he took over the family business um, in 2011, he, he fast forwarded on the nuclear weapons and the ballistic missile programs. He killed his half brother in Malaysia with the chemical nerve agent. He orchestrated the 2014 Sony hack, um, which was a wake up call for Washington on North Korea's cyber capabilities. And, and all that with, without talking to anyone uh, or any head of state except for Dennis Rodman and a Japanese sushi chef. Um, so, but in the first six months of, of his seventh year of power, he's had three summits with the Chinese president, a summit with the U.S. president, and two, at least, two, and so far, two summits with the, with the South Korean president, uh, and a possible one with Vladimir Putin. Um, that's enough to make any leader of any country green with envy, but he was able to do so at the age of 34, um, with a country with a GDP of about $2,000 um, <laughs> and the size of probably Mississippi or Florida. Um, so that's a huge thing that he's accomplished. Um, he was in Singapore being feted by the journalists, by the Singaporeans and, and onlookers. Um, he's, his, his name and his face are splashed mm. all, of, all over the international media. Um, and all that without giving up anything. Um, <coughs> There were no concessions on nuclear weapons programs. Uh, as Ambassador Hill mentioned, there was no mention of any timelines for denuclearization. Um, and so he was able to withstand US maximum pressure. He was able to withstand all of the judgments of those who said that a 27-year-old can't run a country. Um, and in 2018, he has accomplished what his grandfather started um, and what his father nurtured over the past 65 years, um, and which, which is to have a, uh, a nuclear weapons capability, um, as well as the international prestige of being recognized as having that, um, those capabilities um, at, capped by the summit with the US president. So do you think he feels at this point, okay, so it's game over, I won? Yes. Um, if you look at their media, um, the, the state media, they talk about how they were able to how Kim Jong-un was so able to expertly uh, manage the Trump model, to manage the US system, to complete their nuclear weapons program. Um, remember that in the same breath that, he, that Kim Jong-un talked about um, going to the Olympics in South Korea, he also said he was going to mass produce nuclear weapons. Um, so from Kim's perspective, he's completed his program. Um, and that the reason he was able to accomplish all of these things, including these summits, was because he had possession of these weapons. Jay, how are you reading what happened at the summit? Uh, if anything, I think it's a little more dispiriting uh, even than that. I mean, we have, uh, uh, despite 
a lot of hard work and good efforts and some measurable achievements, both in the six-party agreement and, and, and in the framework. Basically, the history of our negotiation with North Korea since the development of their nuclear program began has basically been one of largely failure. Um, this tiny, hermetically sealed Stalinist family business now has nuclear weapons. They have a delivery system. The weapon that they tested last uh, November is about 15 times the, the, the power of the, the bomb that landed in Hiroshima. And we've basically watched this happen. And although we've had a lot of failures, this failure, I think, is actually particularly uh, problematic because it came after what I thought was some real promise. I thought Trump, perhaps because of the kind of madman you know, policy, had actually galvanized some international uh, cons you know, consensus around sanctions. The sanctions looked like they were starting to really work. Um, Kim Jong-un was fearful for his personal security. Um, and yet, we had been holding out some nice carrots. The Olympics was really important to him. The summit was a big deal for him. And I think we came into it in a position to actually use that power to extract some concessions or simply say, sorry, you screwed up. We're done. And we're back to the maximum pressure and the sanctions regime. And instead, we completely capitulated. If you look at this declaration of principles, the statement about nu nuclear weapons is complete denuclearization of the peninsula. That's code word for getting the United States out of South Korea, because South Korea doesn't have nukes. So it's, and frankly, you know, they would see it, I think, as kind of an arms control reduction. If we reduced our nuclear weapons in South Korea to say, 50 or 60, then they would feel, OK, we can only have 50 or 60, which is probably a little more than they have now. So it's completely asymmetrical. And I think that, you know, Sean is right. We, we basically have given him what he wants. He now has the nuclear capability. Obviously, it can be improved. Um, and, and that's fortunate for us. That means we still have time to go back to a real regime of sanctions. I would say that if Secretary Pompeo can't, within relatively short order, three to six months, actually get some progress, meaning a declaration of what their weapons are, uh, some process to allow international inspectors to come in, um, we should go back to a much harsher regime. And I don't know that we'll be able to, because we're going to see a lot more resistance from China. After all, what, what Trump did potentially on his own, without even consulting with his military advisors in terms of saying that he was going to suspend the joint exercises, which he just called war games, was basically giving North Korea and China a tremendous, tremendous carrot. So Chris, you, you were a negotiator um, for a long time with North Korea. What cards do you think the US now has to play by itself or in cooperation with China, Japan, and South Korea to incentivize North Korea? to consider that perhaps the game isn't over? Well, first of all, I would agree with the sentiment that the idea of maximum pressure, that is going to be a hard one to get back, uh, to get the Chinese uh, uh, moving on it, even the South Koreans. That said, I think uh, it's very important that there's no effort in the UN Security Council to weaken things. And, and I think we can count on the Trump administration not to reduce sanctions there. So the issue becomes, uh, do, how do these other countries view the way going forward? And uh, I, I, I would also ag agree with Jung that, you know, he, in, in, large, in large respect, uh, Kim Jong-un has achieved what he wanted to achieve. But um, President Trump has not achieved what he wants to achieve, even though he did say that at one point. Yeah. And I know that um, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo has not achieved that. So I think what probably will happen is we'll see uh, Secretary Pompeo go, try to get some declaration, try to get some movement. Um, and by going to North Korea, people who are in this sort of peace camp, you know, like many people in the, in the, um, under Moon Jae-in in, in um, South Korea, they will see a sort of, uh, if not maximum pressure, at least maximum effort 
They'll see a Secretary of State going there, trying to work with them. And I think Pompeo is good enough to explain, you know, how things are going. And uh, I think what, and, and I think he has the prospect of rebuilding kind of support for what we're trying to do. I think where he's got to do something and do something quickly is to figure out the overall architecture. Uh, what role do we see for China? What role do we see for Japan, et cetera? He's got to, he's got to fix that. Uh, he's got to show those countries that we respect their interest in the matter. Mm -hmm. And then he's got to walk back some of the president's comments. The president, first of all, the president started speaking North Korean when he said war games. I mean, we don't use war games. These are joint exercises. Yeah. And militaries have joint exercises so that they will prepare for war and in the hopes that you'll never have a war. And if you think as the president suggested that joint exercises are expensive, try having a real war. So um, I think um, it's up to this um, Secretary of State to kind of walk some of this stuff down. And then to deal with the, the, the to me, worst outcome of the uh, Singapore statement, which was, or the Singapore uh, summit, which was the president saying, I want to bring all the troops home. Well, that was just music to the ears of every North Korean um, communist, every Chinese. So I think we've got to do some course corrections there. Assuming Pompeo can do that, assuming he does put together a good team, and assuming people are not doing too much backbiting in the, um, in the White House, and uh, I mean, it is astounding to me to have John Bolton as the president's national security advisor, who's been dead set against any such consultations. I don't quite see how that's going to work with Pompeo, so they've got to fix that problem. But I think they could probably get a process going forward such that they'll get the North Korean attention again, because right now, uh, Kim is feeling in a very strong position. Let's um, broaden the lens a little bit, John, and look at how uh, South Korea, Japan, and China have looked at the way the summit went. Starting with South Korea, um, how did they, you know, what was the reaction there, given all the efforts that President Moon had made to try to put things on a more peaceful path? Yeah. Um, so, so Chris and Jay have both mentioned the whole bloody nose, um, the, the maximum pressure. Um, the South Korean President Moon, who came in last May, was, was very intent on an engagement policy. Um, and he's been very focused on midwifing this relationship between the US and North Korea. Um, and if the bloody nose, um, thoughts about a military strike on North Korea scared anybody, it was the South Korean president. Um, and, it was, and it was that, um, the bloody nose idea that partly was responsible for driving the President Moon of South Korea to openly embrace um, Kim Jong-un's delegation for the Olympics and to continue to do this shuttle diplomacy with the US and with North Korea to make sure that the summit happened. So if anybody, you know, one of the winners of the Singapore summit was President Moon of South Korea who really wants more engagement with North Korea, less, less maximum pressure. So the, so the South Korean president has been very happy. The, the administration has been very happy. Um, China also was very happy because we're not talking about um, bloody nose strikes anymore. We're talking, uh, we're moving toward the, the, the preferred Chinese version of how to get North Korea to denuclearize, which is to lift up their economy. Um, so, and, and President Trump has already given away the store with potential removal of US troops, the end of joint military exercises, which incensed the Chinese more than the North Koreans, frankly. Um, the Japanese are the only ones left out. So if this was a, an episode of The Bachelor, right, the only one who hasn't had a rose is Japan. Everybody gets a summit. Um, the US gets a summit, South Korea gets a summit, China gets multiple summits, Japan, North Korea doesn't want any of it because Japan is the only country that is still advocating for maximum pressure um, and for human rights and for North Korea to come back and say, we're gonna get rid of our shorter range ballistic missiles that threaten the region, um, and as well as the, and the intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, so Japan is still the outlier. It's still the remaining, you know, it, it had once stood shoulder to shoulder with the US um, on maximum pressure a short six or seven months ago, um, but now um, Japan is on the sidelines. So, um, so I put that in, in those terms where we have this incredible moment where North Korea has a very receptive environment. 
um, to advance its goals. And it has nothing to do with nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles. It has a very pliable government, um, a partner in South Korea. It has a very um, uh, welcoming environment in China. Um, Japan doesn't matter as much because it's really, Japan, it's really South Korea and China and the US that are driving the bus on this. Um, sure, can but, I, go, go ahead. I just, does this mean that you think uh, South Korea is going to come around to the idea that North Korea has nuclear weapons and should be allowed to keep them? And you think the Chinese? I think that, I think that So they're for, gonna announce directly in contradiction of our country, an alliance that has kind of served South Korea pretty well, that they're gonna say, well, actually the Americans are all wrong, we think North Korea should have nuclear weapons? So one of the things that, um, so I do think that they have not said that out loud. Um, but there are elements in the South Korean, in this particular South Korean administration that does want US troops off the peninsula. It does want South Korea to deal with problems on the peninsula by itself. Um, the progressive governments in South Korea have typically tended to be more autonomous or, or wanting to have more independence from the US. Um, so I think while they won't say, the Moon administration won't come out and say that they want the US troops because I think for the most part, Right now, they still want the U.S. troops on the peninsula. There are elements in this administration that, that are um, supportive of more engagement before denuclearization. Hence, we have this peace movement in, in South Korea um, that's trying to get the North Koreans to engage more. But that's a tactic, whether to have more mm -hmm. talks before denuclearization. But I, I mean, my question is, are, do they accept North Korea as a nuclear state? You know, when you ask, um, when you ask various people, how comfortable are you? How comfortable are you with the North Korea with nuclear weapons? Um, and you never get an answer because can you really be comfortable with the North Korea with nuclear weapons? Um, so I think that um, one, that I don't know that if anybody's answered that question or done navel gazing to think about what is the future of the peninsula? Is it a North Korea with nuclear weapons that we just kind of contain? Um, but or or are we going through this max? Or are we going to go through another iteration of maximum I, pressure? I think where we are right now, somewhat regrettably, is that China and South Korea, even though in theory they don't like a nuclear North Korea, basically are okay with the status quo, and frankly more concerned about the alternative, more concerned about what happens with maximum pressure. What happens to the peninsula if Trump actually gets aggressive? And I think John is right. Japan is really left <laughs> out cold, wants to focus on uh, long-term regime change, human rights changes, and I think Trump is less interested, and I think he's, he's misplaying it not just vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, but now misplaying it vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. role in Asia writ large in terms of the U.S.-China relationship. But I think we are moving to a new world right now where a nuclear North Korea is probably going to be the new reality, and I don't see it changing. Mm -hmm. And what the other thing that's interesting is, for since the end of the Korean War, you know, the, the doctrine, the policy in South Korea and the United States has basically been of a unified peninsula, unified by South Korea, and of course, the raison d'etre for North Korea is a unified peninsula under North Korean rule. It's, it's really their kind of racial policy of unification. What's happened now is there's no indication that North Korea doesn't want that. And in fact, the real reason why they need nuclear weapons that can threaten the United States is to push the United States out of the peninsula so that potentially, as unrealistic as it probably is, they can still try to pursue that dream. Whereas I think South Korea has said, we don't care about a unified peninsula. We just want some type of detente. We just want to live and, and let live. And China, of course, wouldn't be heartbroken if US troops left the oh, Korean they would, peninsula. They would, be, they would be thrilled for all sorts of reasons having nothing to do with North Korea. Yeah. Let me stay with you, Jay. I wanted to ask, I mean, you were the human rights point person a decade ago in, uh, for the Bush administration related to North Korea. Um, Human rights hasn't been part of these negotiations. Um, in fact, President Trump kind of shrugged and said, you know, everyone's got their issues, yeah, you know. There are problems everywhere. Um, and, and, and yet North Korea still has its issues. It, it does, and it's, I mean, it is truly an unprecedented human rights catastrophe on, on a scale that we, 
we really haven't seen in, in the last 50 years anywhere. Hundreds of thousands of North Koreans locked up in concentration camps. Um, I've met over the last 15 years with dozens of defectors, and the stories they tell about what happened to their families, what the, the torture that they suffer, I mean, it is truly the most inhumane regime. And we're talking about the way Kim treats his own people. This is the same person that Trump said, well, he, he, he loves his country, loves his people. Now, human rights is a complicated issue for, for diplomacy, and in rare circumstances, I think, should human rights be an end in and of itself, um, but it certainly can be a means to an end. It should be part of the dialogue. When, when North Korea was welcomed to be a full participant in the Olympics, there should have been some quid pro quo. There should have been some effort to galvanize the international community, to force some opening, to address the, the, the situation in the concentration camps, to try to get Red Cross visits, to get humanitarian inspectors to come in. None of that is even on the table right now. And I think it's, it's really, it's, it's a shame and an embarrassment for the United States that we're engaging with North Korea and completely abdicating any moral voice. Uh, John ahead. had her hand up, and then we'll come right to you. Um, you know, one of the one of the underlying assumptions about um, the uh, the way the Trump administration has been couching this um, this deal with North Korea is that North Korea that Kim Jong Un will be rich, his people can be rich. We can help you. American entrepreneurs can help you lift these people out of poverty, and that you can have all of the great things that we have. Um, the problem is that that's mirror imaging of what a real estate businessman from New York City is stamping on a 34-year-old dictator of a country that has never known democratic governance and rules by repression and fear. Um, and to think that somehow promising a McDonald's franchise in North Korea is going to get Kim to say, yes, that is exactly what I wanted. Um, Kim is already rich. Um, he's got villas. He's got um, uh, you know, a, a fleet of luxury vehicles. Um, he doesn't need franchises in North Korea to, um, to finally you know, lift the North Koreans um, from the depths of despair. Um, so I think we have to get rid of those assumptions. Um, but it, but you know, one of the things that, that these, the summitry has engendered is the idea that maybe Kim is really changed. Um, and this is where I feel like the friend of someone who has a really bad boyfriend. <laughs> he's not, maybe he's not like his father. Um, maybe it's because of what we're doing that he acts this way. Maybe if we show him what good, you know, what this is, then, um, that, you know, that he'll see the light and change his behavior. Um, and this is when I would go, girl, <laughs> no. Um, this is something that his, this is the, nu the nuclear weapons program and Kim's commitment to, the, to them um, is, a, is something that has been building in North Korea for 50 years. Um, and to give that all away, um, the nu nuclear weapons program are in the constitution, it's in their culture, it's in their ideology, it's in their language, it's on their stamps. Um, to think that they would all be given away for American entrepreneurs running around North Korea to, to build up businesses um, would be the height of, of betrayal to the legacy of his grandfather and his father. So, um, and I think human rights would be a signpost for me that Kim was serious. But so far, because we're not raising human rights, because he's not done anything in terms of um, ameliorating that situation, I just don't see how um, that, that he's serious about the nuclear issue if he's not improving on human rights. Very briefly, and, and the point is he doesn't want North Korea to be a startup nation. That's not his ambition. In fact, the only way he can continue to maintain this repressive rule is if an overwhelming percentage of his population lives in darkness, doesn't get a full meal, doesn't have internet access. So he actually doesn't want the things that we, when we mirror image, say, well, it's all about economic development, and if only everybody could, could be successful, then he'll change and their society will change. That would actually undermine the core foundation of that family business. Chris. Look, on the subject of bashing 
President Trump comes up, I'm there. I can go all night. <laughs> but I think what we need to do is look at what the next steps are in this very difficult process. I have no doubt that this approach that uh, to Kim Jong-un somehow you can be rich if you follow us means nothing to him. And, and just the, the amount of cultural missignals is, is endless. But I think the issue is how can we sharpen the choices and incentivize North Korea such that they will understand that a, a future without nuclear weapons is somehow better than a future with nuclear weapons. I would agree that their calculation right now is they've gotten this far with nuclear weapons and, and this is what they ought to do. But I would also, as my earlier question to Jung suggests, I don't think the United States or anyone should acquiesce in the proposition that North Korea should have nuclear weapons. I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. And whatever it takes, I'm not one of these people who wants to say in Aspen, Colorado, that we ought to go to war in, in North Korea, because if you live in South Korea, that's a very consequential argument, much more so than when you're here in Colorado. But I think we ought to be looking for all kinds of means whether it's sabotaging their program, whether it's uh, you know, uh, doing a lot of uh, clandestine operations against them, whether it's trying to ratchet up the sanctions, whether it's sinking a submarine, whatever it takes, I think we ought to do it. And so I don't agree with the idea of telling the North Koreans, hey, you, know, you can be rich, you can get a McDonald's franchise. Uh, you know, that's not going to help, but we do need to be thinking about how to incentivize them on this issue. And then I'd just like to mention human rights, because I was in the Foreign Service for 33 years. I was in the Balkans, I, I was uh, in Iraq I, uh, and North Korea, and dealing with North Korea. And I can assure you, and I, I want to assure people here, that human rights is something we always discuss, and moreover, we try to do something about. And with respect to North Korea, it was hard to bring up human rights in the context of a six-party talks. I always remember my Russian counterpart saying, what's the matter, don't you think this is hard enough that you're now going to bring in human rights? I mean, it, it was very hard to bring that up. But I did talk to the North Koreans about it, and I told them very specifically that if we get to this next phase where we will establish uh, we will negotiate diplomatic relations, which was, which was envisioned in the six-party statement, we would have a separate uh, venue, a separate um, uh, working group, if you will, to discuss human rights, to have a human rights dialogue. This is something we've had with a lot of sort of in from the cold uh, dictatorships. We've talked to a lot of these on human rights with the understanding that they're not going to become Switzerland uh, but if they can start going in the right direction as opposed to continuing to go in the wrong direction. So I think uh, Americans should feel pretty good about our career services, our career foreign services, always dealing with this issue. But I'm telling you, when you're, when you're matching it up against uh, nuclear war, uh, it's tough. It's very tough. But it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in context. And certainly, I did not have the impression it was even thought of in Singapore. I have problems about that. I have problems with a lot of what was done there, but I think we need to think going forward here. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to questions from, from you in just a moment, but Jung had one yeah, more thing um, she wanted I'm to I'm a big fan of the maximum pressure policy. I was a big fan of it. Um, and I was really, you know, I was hopeful that the maximum pressure, as Jay mentioned, would have led to some serious concession from North Korea. Um, but I was um, disappointed to see that all of that pressure and all of that U.S. effort that the Trump administration had, had garnered um, just kind of dissipated um, after the summit. So um, it's going to be hard to get maximum pressure back, especially if North Korea does nothing terrible. Um, but I think... Um, that maximum pressure was something that the Trump administration was doing well, um, and it's something that should have been continued because I think ultimately Kim has to decide whether he's afraid, more afraid of the U.S. or more for afraid of his people. Um, and that was the, and, and maximum pressure, I thought, was had the potential to reorient his thinking about having nuclear weapons program. And uh, just in a nutshell, because not everyone here necessarily knows what the, the maximum 
pressure policy is, what were the components? Yeah. What are the components? Um, it was sanctions, diplomatic isolation. Um, and the sanctions were different this time around since 2016 because they focused on the entirety of North Korea money making. Uh, so before 2016, we used to look at North Korea and sanctioning entities that were specifically and demonstrably known to be new, uh, weapons um, uh, entities that were either procuring parts or selling parts. Um, but since 2016, sanctions have looked at everything in terms of the 100,000 North Korea laborers that they send ab abroad to earn money for the regime, so basically slave labor. Um, talking about coal imports, talking about iron. You're talking multilateral. Talking multilateral. Yeah. And we had, China, we had China's total support on this. Um, and, you know, and so far, ever since you know, the early part of 2018, more Chinese tourists are going into North Korea. Um, the economic activity is um, starting to get revved up uh, along the border between um, China and North Korea. So, um, so I thought maximum pressure was an excellent policy and something that we should have followed. Uh, questions? Um, okay, let's start right down here and we'll move back. I don't see a lot of hands over here, but I'll look for them. I see one now. Okay. Hi, my name is Patrick Sagal and I spent a month last year driving around North Korea uh, as an anthropologist. Um, and I wanted to ask you, do you think that the fact that the second language of North Korea is English or that the highways in North Korea all have Korean and English on them has an impact on the mentality of the Korean people who the Korean people don't hate American, by the way? To whom would you like to ask the question? Um, any one of those three. And whether you think that the trade between China and um, North Korea is making a big impact with 200,000 tourists from North Korea or from China going to North Korea every year as far as impacting their society and whether Xi Jinping just told Kim that uh, one country, two um, systems like they have with uh, China and Hong Kong is going to be what the Korean Peninsula will go forward. I've, I've only been there three times. Have you, have you, so Just in my mind. Yeah, all right, well... <laughs> All right, go ahead. I, I was going to say, look, I, I think the, there's we should clearly be engaging with them, and I and I like the fact that Trump was combining the maximum pressure with a clear willingness to reach out to engage, and I think the more engagement we can have, the better it is. I just think we have to continue to negotiate and act from a position of strength, and I think what we've done in the last few weeks is turn it to a position of weakness. There's no question, more Chinese engagement, more involvement, more English, more internet, it's all gonna be helpful in terms of ultimately cracking open that society. Um, but again, you know, even when they talk about family reunification visits, they never talk about them going the other direction because of course that, that, that can't be spoken about because the North Koreans would never permit that. And I think we just have to recognize that Taking the, the human rights issues as a larger basket in terms of recognizing that it's all about opening up that country, uh, that has to be tied. I, I actually, I guess the one place where I think I might disagree a little bit with Chris is I wouldn't try to put human rights on a separate independent track. I would link it directly to the economic and to the military issues in the same way we did with the Soviets in the, in the 1970s in the, after the Helsinki Accords. I think they go part and parcel, and when we see movement, whether it's movement on human rights or movement on weapons, then I think we can do something in return, because I think all of that moves us towards the right end result. I'll add, go ahead. I'll add something from my own trips to North Korea in 1989 and 2005. So in 89, people seemed like they were just really afraid to talk to Western visitors. In 2005, something significant had shifted. And um, even, you know, there was more room for us to move around in Pyongyang. Um, even our minders seemed more Westernized, seemed much more aware of what was happening in America and in the West. Um, our, one of our minders, this is someone from the foreign ministry, actually, you know, sort of loosened up as we were there, a group of journalists, and said, you know, you know, we talk about how America's the enemy, but in fact, we look at China's geopolitical ambitions and we know that they like our ports and we're kind of concerned about that too. I mean, that was in 2005 when the, a, Chire a, a Chinese think tank had made this claim that the or originating kingdom of Korea, the Koguryo kingdom, was a Chinese 
entity, right? Um, and then just to cap it all off, our minders serenade, ser serenaded us on the bus at the end with my heart will go on, which they knew all the words to. So there, there is some openness. I mean, not to overstate it, this is just an anecdote, but you know, it felt like there was some loosening up. One of the people, one of those minders, his sister was studying finance in Malaysia. So there were also moves being made even back then to start to move North Korea in at least a slightly different direction. You were going to say. Yeah, I think, first of all, I would agree with your impression that people are not implacably opposed to the United States. I mean, uh, it's an impression, and I think that is correct. The trouble is, I don't think public opinion counts for a lot in, uh, in North Korea. And I think we're, we're dealing with a regime that quite famously ignores uh, the interests uh, of their people. But certainly, any visit to North Korea, and I, I went out to this um, nuclear facility, uh, Yongbyon, and you know we went through these villages, and uh, it was pretty grinding poverty. I mean, I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa, and I, it was pretty similar to you know where I was stationed, frankly. Uh, and um, you know, it did make me think: these are people concentrating on where they're getting their next meal. Um, not talking about changing the system. They are pretty much focused on their next meal. And when you look at a, a public's preparedness for uh, political change, it's usually in the context of rising expectations. And I, I sure didn't see any rising expectations there. So there's one body of opinion that basically says, oh, we should help them out, you know, uh, open, uh, open up to North Korea. Their people will say, wait a minute, we're, we're missing out on a lot, and they'll rise up. Unfortunately, it's not that simple uh, for some of the reasons that Jay talked about. I mean, this is about as oppressive. They will, um, they will arrest you and throw you into prison for nothing, and then they'll arrest your whole family simply because they're related to you. I mean, uh, I was in a place called Albania, and in the 80s, under a guy named Enver Hoxha, that's exactly what happened. It was so-called bad biography. So, you know, you can't really talk about sort of people to people with North Korea unless you're prepared to deal with that uh, with that terrible government. And with respect to South Korea on this issue of family unification, it is one of the most gut-wrenching uh, scenes when they bring these families from North Korea to meet their loved ones from South Korea, you know, 85-year-old uh, you know, brothers and sisters who've been separated. And it's just awful. And you know how a lot of that stuff even got done to get these families in? The South Koreans paid the money, they paid the North Korean regime money to bring in these families. So, you know, paying the money, you know, you don't want to, you know, uh, reward bad behavior, and that's what you're doing. But how else do you get this 85-year-old to meet his 86-year-old sister or something? And, and the same thing on this uh, MIA issue, this um, issue of finding the remains of our troops. We had that going for a number of years, and Secretary Rumsfeld said, well, why are we paying these people money? Good question. And so he cut off the whole thing. And of course, it was restarted in, in Singapore. Again, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, you're making a tough call, but you're trying to do it because there are people in the states who want you know, their, their uncle's remains. If they can get those remains, they can have a proper religious uh, service and say goodbye. So it's, it's just really, these are tough dilemmas. You know? I saw, yeah, a um, gentleman with a beard and glasses right there, yes. Hi, I have uh, two uh, two-part questions. So first of all, let's go forward three to six months, say Pompeo doesn't make much progress. If we restart the joint exercises, how will the North Koreans react? And furthermore, what about the spread of nuclear technology and missiles to other countries or other parties? John, do you want to take that? Three to six months. Um, you know, Judging from the way Kim Jong-un has been dealing with the program and with the United States, um, I can, I'll say that in three to six months, he'll, that Kim is probably unlikely to make um, significant concessions or will continue to not make significant concessions. Um, and I think that um, what the North Koreans do best is to drag out things, um, drag out the return of remains, drag out family reunions. Um, and I think for, for military exercises, you know, North Koreans are also good on picking up on opportunities to say, the, the U.S. has been going back on its word. How can we trust you? 
um, and, and, to, um, and to, to justify whatever actions or bad actions that they're, they might um, be willing to take. Um, so that, I think that's what's, what, what I see happening in, in the next three to six months. I saw, yeah, the woman at the and end of row two over here. Part. The second part. Oh, sorry. Second part. Second part was? Uh, a proliferation of missile and nuclear technology. That's a big problem, right? I mean, there was a, the, the reason we're not comfortable with North Korea having nuclear weapons or chemical biological weapons, that they have the third largest stockpile in the world of chemical and biological weapons, they're willing to use it. Um, there, were some, there was a UN report about a possible connection to Syria. Um, so, you know, this is a multifaceted threat that North Korea poses. It's not just the ballistic missiles, it's not just the fissile material, but it's also the chemical biological weapons. Um, and so um, proliferation is something that, that we're looking at. But, but you know what the North Koreans have said is that we're responsible nuclear weapons power. You know, we're not gonna do all those nasty things because we're responsible. Um, so that's in their statements about how, how they should be accepted as having nuclear weapons and all of these bad capabilities. Um, so I think um, for North Koreans to do that, um, I think would be a, in, in a, it, the, the problem with proliferation is that it's plausibly deniable and it takes a long time to verify the link, the clear linkages. Yeah, Briefly, so we can yeah, get one more question. I was just gonna say, and I think the dynamic in three or four months is we are gonna find that we're not making any real progress, certainly nothing measurable, verifiable, and the United States is gonna have a much harder time going back to where we were pre-Singapore, in large part because we're not gonna be able to get the Chinese on board. The only way to do that is gonna to be to ramp up the kind of pressure that we need to put on China, and that opens up a whole other can of worms that's contentious for us and raises other issues. So I, I really think the only credit you can give Trump right now, other than the credit for actually the 18 months leading up to Singapore, is now for alleviating, alleviating potentially the imminent threat of some catastrophic event on the peninsula, which he himself almost created. So he's, he's lessened the pressure that he created, and now he wants to get a pat on the back for that. I think, just real quick, I think one of the problems with keeping up the pressure was Kim Jong-un's charm offensive. He says to the South Koreans, hey, we wish you a happy Olympics. We hope everything goes well. Uh, gee, we, we'd love to meet with the Americans. And so they put all this out there. And meanwhile, we would then have to ignore that and then continue to urge maximum pressure, which I, you know, I understand, but I think it was going to be a hard lift anyway. So I think, you know, uh, I'm trying to maybe gild this lily, but I mean, the president says, okay, we'll deal with them. And then in three months, he says, look, world, we did it your way, and we've gotten nothing from them. That's maybe a more powerful argument than ignoring all the uh, nice things that Kim Jong-un said on January 1st. Right. With, with apologies, a um, lot of interesting answers, but they've just, we, we've run out of time. So I think our panelists will probably stay around after, so please feel free to come up and, and talk to them. Thank you, Christopher Hill, John Pack, and Jay Lefkowitz. Thank you all for being here.